Okay, well, today's message is more, it's less a sermon and more a sermonette. Um, because, and here's why, <clears throat> growing up in my Italian-American family, Christmas did not end until January the 6th. We took full advantage of the entire 12 days of Christmas. And so it is not yet January 6th, therefore, we can still celebrate Christmas we can still meditate upon the miracle of God becoming a man. And as such, um, I don't, you know, these kinds of messages about Christmas I think are, are wonderful, um, but they don't need to be very long, do they? No, I don't think so. So hopefully we will um, spend some time this morning really just pondering the miracle of the humanity of God, the God-man who became incarnate for us. Uh, let's pray, and I guess we will begin. Thank you, Father, one more time for allowing us to be in this place. Please send us that spirit of wisdom in the general sense, but also specifically right now. Open our minds to what it is you would have us to learn today, to hear today and send us home from this place filled up with grace and truth which comes to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, before we begin, somebody confirm for me we're supposed to have potluck today. Is that happening today? Yes, yes. okay, amen. Hope you can stay for a nice New Year's meal. Uh, and also I have to say how impressed I am with every one of you. Uh, for being here on January 1st. I think the world would fully understand you choosing not to be here on such a day, but especially if you were also here last week, that is really impressive dedication to God. And I, I want to acknowledge that and thank you for your faith that is on display simply by your presence here this morning. All right. Uh, what happened here? It skipped all the way to the end. <laughs> there we go. Okay. The God man. So Christmas, which is not a word that I love for all the various reasons. I know that we have a wide spectrum of how we all relate to the Christmas holiday. Um, and so I, I don't love that word because of all of the reasons that go into some of our resistance to the holiday. But nonetheless, that is the word that we're given to celebrate um, the, the holiday dedicated to remembering that God, the invisible God, became a human being and dwelt among us. So Christmas is a not a biblical holiday in so far as that word is not in the Bible at all and there is no prescription for the opening of presents or a Christmas tree or any of the things that we kind of load into that holiday however the basic premise of the holiday is in fact biblical it remembers the events that are recorded in the second chapters of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay? And according to the scriptures, and according to biblical Christian belief, this was a moment when God became a, a human. This was a moment more profound than any other moment ever seen in the universe up to that point. In the entire universe, the entire cosmos, to use the Greek word, right? Up until that point. It was the moment when the invisible divine world became part of this world. When divinity itself entered into its own creation. And the moment when mankind first had real evidence that there was anything for them beyond this plane of existence and the death which inevitably follows it. It was an incredible moment <clears throat> when God not only took on human flesh, but did so for the express purpose of obliterating death. 
And I've, I've preached about that aspect of Christmas in the past, and I realized after the fact that I probably should revisit that. Um, because the way that we celebrate Christmas, especially in the United States, it's very commercial and it's very happy, right? But that's not actually the way that Christmas has been used throughout Christian history, right? It's not all just like happy and presents. It was a time that was dedicated for the pondering of the deeper and more eternal things of life. And that includes death. That includes death. It's a time to ponder death, and it's a time to ponder eternal life. And so <clears throat> I want to direct us to a popular Christmas hymn. Hark the herald angels sing. Because I want us to look at the lyrics therein. You know, and maybe maybe you already do this, but I dare say I think probably a lot of us do not. We just kind of sing the songs that we grew up with. We know them by heart, but we don't necessarily pay attention to what they are saying. The reason I'm so confident by the of that, by the way, is some of those Christmas carols <laughs> have really twisted messages. <laughs> if you stop to like really pay attention to what they're saying. Uh, Bring us some figgy pudding. We won't go until we get some. I mean, that's like a temper tantrum on your front porch, immortalized in a Christmas carol. Anyway, Hark the Herald Angels Sing says the following. Hello. That is, all right, guys, I need your help because this is not working. There you go. <clears throat> Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and Life and light to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Let's go to the next one, please. Nope, there should be another one. Yeah, there we go. Mild he lays his glory by, born, why? That man no more may die. This child, this baby, laid in a manger, right, born amongst animals, the purpose of that birth was ultimately so that mankind would die no more. Would die no more. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Now, if we we're looking only at that last line, born to give them second birth, I mean, that should make sense to us. My hope is that every one of us here has been born again, right? That's a... a a common phraseology in Christianity, certainly in American Protestant Christianity, right? But when you combine it with the second line, the second to last line, born to raise the sons of earth, I think we're talking about more than just the born again aspect of our current lives here. Ultimately, Jesus Christ was born so that every one of us can experience a resurrection. Born to raise the sons of earth from the grave. Born to give them second birth into eternity. And I think probably all of our Christmas experiences could stand to, um, to focus more on this kind of divine and eternal aspect of a holiday that most mostly is simply acknowledged with you know eggnog and sweets and time off from work born to raise the sons of earth I, I don't know about you I'm looking forward to that day so much to be raised unto eternity raised unto a body that will no longer decay or grow older uh, I know I'm not the only one in this room, even right now, who is longing for that perfect and incorruptible body. And we have that promise because of that little child, God, born into human flesh. See, it was the moment when God touched man. And not really unlike 
the famous painting on the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's painting. You may be familiar with that. That's where God is reaching out to Adam, and Adam is kind of reaching back. Did you ever notice, though, in that painting, God is reaching out with a fully extended finger, whereas Adam is reaching out with his finger cocked? That, that's not an accident, you know? That's, that's an expression that God's desire for us is greater than our desire for God. You know, even Adam himself is like, yeah, you know, he kind of, kind of reaching out to you, but uh. it's the moment when God touched man more profoundly than that image by Michelangelo um, even expresses. Because God did not just touch man passively. He actually became man incarnately, bodily, permanently. We all understand that, right? From the scriptures, we understand that he is the lamb as he had been slain from the foundation of the world, that he will carry the marks of the crucifixion with him forever and ever as a perpetual reminder of the experience with sin. The incredible condescension of God to take on human flesh is mind-boggling to me. Just think about what that means. Think about all the things that you attribute to God that are greater than what we can attribute to us. All right? God the Holy Spirit can be everywhere all at once. You and I can be in one place at a time. And that's what Jesus chose. He chose to have the limitations of human flesh forever. Forever. Permanently. To experience what we experience forever and ever. Now God could have become anything he wanted. He has that ability. right? He could have shown up as a grown man like he appears to do in John's gospel and also Mark's. He, the first time we meet him, he's a grown-up, walking and preaching. But God did not choose to enter creation fully grown. He chose to identify with the human experience so fully that he embodied every single aspect of it, from conception to birth, from infancy to maturity, from death even unto resurrection. And I like to think about Jesus being conceived because we know that he was born to a virgin and so the conception did not happen in the natural way and he had no earthly father that he could point to as from whom he received half of his genetics. And yet, he was a full person like you and I, which means he had the same number of chromosomes that you do. So where did the other half of his genetics come from? Isn't that an amazing thought? What, what does the genome of God look like? <laughs> it's astounding to me. Jesus Christ redeemed every part of human existence so that no aspect of human existence would be beyond salvation. As, as evidence that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you have done or at what stage of life you may be in, you are able to be redeemed. Thank you for that. Amen. He became every part of human life so that all of life would be infused with divine value. I'm just going to leave that there and let us meditate upon that idea because I think it's a lot more profound than we often give it credit for. He became every part of human life so all aspects of life would be infused with divine value. Practically speaking, if Jesus was sitting in the pew across from you, would you gossip about him? 
I'm going to interpret the lack of response as all of us collectively agreeing, no, we would not gossip about him. But if the divine value of Jesus Christ is present in every aspect of human life, then why would we gossip about each other? That's what I mean. The implications of this are deep and broad, and they stand really as a, as a rebuke against a lot of our common behaviors. Every single aspect of life is infused with divine value because of what Jesus did. And so you and I live in a time of trouble right now. Maybe it's not the time of trouble, right? But it's certainly a time of trouble. As I mentioned a few times already today, um, in two and a half months, we will celebrate the unfortunate anniversary of two weeks to slow the spread. <laughs> and we'll enter into the third year of such a thing. Last Christmas, we were instructed not to go visit our own families. Um, this, this past holiday season, you remember they tried to do that again, but there was such an uproar that they, you know, the science changed and now it was okay to go see each other. Right, but we're still under this oppression. We're still under these, you know, these government mandates, but even without the government, this virus is still out there and it's still killing people. Maybe not Omicron, but Delta's still out there, right? We live in a time of trouble. We, we, we know that it costs you approximately twice as much to fill up your gas or to fill up your car with gas now as it did a year ago, right? We live in a time of trouble. And it's precisely because of these times of trouble and, and others like it that, that Jesus did what he did, right? That's why we have a savior who knows every part of humankind. So last year, maybe you didn't go get to see your family. Maybe you chose not to for whatever reason, and you were lonely, and you're thinking this is the first time in what, 10 years or 20 years or 50 years that I have not spent time with my loved ones and this time of year. I'm lonely, I'm scared. But we have a savior who knows the depths of loneliness and fear and despair and hunger and also hope hope for redemption longing for peace he knows everything everything that we face he's experienced it he identifies with it he has redeemed it and he promises to walk with every one of us through it so when the entire world fails you as it seems to do frequently these days, Jesus Christ stands there as our perfect substitute, right? to stand in our place, to bear our burdens with us, and to join us in our sufferings, whatever they may be. He's there to offer us hope for a better tomorrow and hope for a better world to come. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called our God when we desire a better country. It is a heavenly country because he has prepared such a thing for us. That was my paraphrase of Hebrews 11, verse 16. <laughs> He's promised us a better world to come. No matter what this world throws at you, no matter how burdened we are by it, no matter what we are called to face and to endure, he offers us the hope of a better world to come. Hallelujah. But as you know, this promise, these promises of redemption did not come cheaply, did they? The promise of salvation cost the Son of God an infinite price. And it's, it's difficult even to consider what that price would be when we think about Jesus as a baby. Babies are awesome. I mean, they're loud and, you know, needy, but they're fantastic. I mean, they're, they're, they're cute. They're cuddly. They love you just because you're there, you know, and looking down at such a little person and thinking about the crucifixion, 
thinking about the persecution from the Pharisees, that's, that's almost diff, it's almost impossible to imagine. But it did cost him an infinite price, and not just the loss of his life 30-odd years later. He permanently entered into his creation. He permanently became one of us. The sheer condescension that he must have endured to become one of us. Like you and I are made of of the elements. The Bible calls it the dust, right? We are from dust to dust. From dust we came and to dust we shall return. We are constituted by atoms and molecules and all the same building blocks of everything as everything else. God, in his spirit form, is not made of those things. He's somehow different and above all those things. But when Jesus became one of us, he chose to constitute his existence through that which can be seen and felt. That boggles my mind why God would do that. And then not only did he do that, but after he took on human flesh, he allowed it to be mortified. He allowed it to be broken and abused. And he experienced torment that was so great that it got its own word, by which I mean the word excruciating. Did you ever realize the root of that word is the same as the root of crucifixion, excruciating? Because the torment of the cross is so bad, there were not words to describe it. And Jesus chose that for himself. He poured out his life unto death the eternal one, the eternal one, the one for whom there is no beginning and no end. It's a paradox that our minds cannot fully understand. What existed before God? Nothing. Was there ever a time before God? If so, where was God? Right? We, we don't have answers to these questions. But the eternal one, through death, entered into the voidness of the absence of life. The eternal one ceased to exist. I'm saying that to a room full of Seventh-day Adventists, okay? Because if you believe differently about the nature of death, then you come to different conclusions, and most Christians in the world do not believe that he ceased to exist in death, right? And even scripturally, right, Jesus says, I will raise myself up. So in that voidness, he still somehow was responsible for his own resurrection. Um, but you get my point, right? The eternal one closed his eyes in death. It's astounding to me. Well, the very Godhead itself was sundered when the Father abandoned the Son completely on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But I thank God that that is what happened because by his stripes we are healed, amen? By his wounds we are cleansed, by his suffering we are made whole. And so even in the pondering of death, even in the pondering of the unfortunate realities of sin, we are still confronted with hope and redemption, salvation unto eternity for all who desire it, including you. including you. And I just kind of think that Christmas is a lovely time to dwell on such things. 
Jesus Christ was born to know every part of who you are and to die for your sins so that you may know him in return. That's the whole point. He knows everything about you. I want us, you know, maybe that's the point to walk away with today. How many people have I met over the course of my career who are straight up dishonest with God? They want one thing, but they pray for something else because what I want is not suitable for prayer. <laughs> so they actually end up lying to God in prayer as if that's somehow going to work. Christ knows every part of who you are. And he chose you for his service anyway. And he wants you to know him just as intimately. He died on the cross to remove you from your sins for that very purpose. So you may know him just as well as he knows you. Maybe, just maybe, this is the year that that is, becomes true for us. Maybe this is the year that we all come to know Jesus in the way that he wants us to. Merry Christmas. I know it's a week late, but I wasn't here last week, so Merry Christmas to all of you. Happy New Year, and may God bless you all. I pray that we can meditate on these things in such a way that our lives are changed. Um, so we have a closing song.